good day. It's August 5, 2024, with just 100 days before the 2024 election. Vice President Kamala Harris is surging in the polls in some battleground swing states, while Trump's popularity is on a steady decline. I'm Joe Buban. Welcome to the polls. And I'm Sam Buban. Vanity Fair magazine describes Kamala Harris like a defibrillator to the Democratic Party in this race. It's like trying to jumpstart the polls of the Democratic Party. The Hill reports that Harris leads two points in Arizona, Nevada, and Wisconsin, while she leads in Michigan by 11 points, while both Harris and Trump are tied in Georgia. The Daily Mail reports that Harris leads by one point nationally by 48% versus Trump's 47%. In the online news Real Clear Politics, Harris leads by four points in the general election nationwide in the generic ballot. But in New Hampshire, Vice President Harris lead by seven points in a three-way race between Trump, Harris, and Kennedy. The right-wing media has been obsessed in their critic of her success and her presidential run since her time as Attorney General of California all the way to her presidential run. Most calling her a DEI candidate and most labeling her as a mistress who slept her way to the top. DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion and initials name calling to help all diverse backgrounds of ethnicities to achieve same goals and to be treated fairly in the workplace. Most right-wing commentators and officials have used the DEI initiative as an attack slur against government officials of diverse racial backgrounds. The National Association of Black Journalists held a forum hosting former President Donald Trump in Chicago that proved to be disastrous for the former president. Trump antagonized uh, ABC correspondent Rachel Scott after she brought up about Kamala Harris' racial heritage. He said she was always been Indian and she was only promoting Indian heritage. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black. Harris, who is of Indian mother and Jamaican father, responded in her campaign speech in Houston and it was the same old show the divisiveness and the disrespect. In a recent rally in Atlanta, Georgia last Tuesday, VP Kamala Harris went on a derogatory on immigration, attempting to contradict former President Donald Trump's attacks on the issue. As she quotes, Donald Trump does not care about border security. He only cares about himself, adding that she would work to pass the bill as president, Harris said. Kamala Harris must have been referring to the bipartisan bill in the Senate, spearheaded by Republican Senator from Oklahoma, James Lankford, which would have funded and addressed many border needs. But Trump, through his surrogates in the House of Representatives, killed the bill in the House because Trump didn't want a solution to the border crisis because it was going to look good for the Biden administration during this election cycle. VP Harris also called on Trump to a debate with her, creating loud cheers and clapping from the crowd while saying, because as the saying goes, if you've got something to say, say it to my face. From an online news of CNN, VP Kamala Harris supports increasing the number of Border Patrol agents. It is remembered that Donald Trump blocked a bill to increase the number of Border Patrol agents during his presidential term. Harris prosecuted transnational gang members and got them sentenced to prison, while saying that Trump is trying to avoid being sentenced to prison concluding her words with, there's two choices in this election, the one who will fix our broken immigration system and the one who is trying to stop it. In the Arizona Republican primary,
Kerry Lake, the election denier who lost her gubernatorial bid in 2022, came out as the winner to represent the Republican Party for the U.S. Senate against Democrat Ruben Gallego. For the seat of the Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema, who is retiring at the end of her term this year, we are going to take a commercial break. Please stay with us. Pure Medical Equipment provides top-notch quality medical supply equipment. Whether to rent or buy, Pure Medical Equipment and Supplies has it all. Pure Medical Equipment is committed to serve and give back to Southern Nevada. We deliver medical supplies and rentals to your door. From the Telly Award winning creator of Love and Karma, Legacy and Ultra Feminist. Underneath the bright neon lights of Sin City, where fortunes are won and lost in an instant, and the truth can be a bit hazy. Join Elena, a hardworking single mother, her hot headed son Miguel, and Gabriel, a Filipino pop star on the brink of international stardom. As they embark on a journey of self-discovery, love, and the courage to find one's voice and speak the truth. Made to Shine, coming soon. Presented by Philam TV Network. Written and directed by Giovanni Espiritu. To keep updated or for more information, visit philamtv.us slash made to shine or scan the QR code to be added to the email list for updates and upcoming opportunities to be part of the show. Executive produced by Sam Bubon and Esmeralda Padilla Gould. Israel said its Israeli strike in Beirut killed a key commander of the Hezbollah, according to Al Jazeera. In a retaliatory airstrike against the Lebanese armed group for a cross-border rocket attack on, that killed 12 children three days ago, the Israeli military claimed to have killed Hezbollah's most senior commander on Tuesday. At approximately 7.40 p.m. in Beirut, about 16.40 Greenwich Mean Time, a loud explosion was heard and a cloud of smoke was visible rising above Beirut's southern suburbs, a stronghold of Hezbollah, which is supported by Iran. According to Israeli Defense Minister Yaoub Galant, Fuad Shakur, who is, has the blood of many Israelis on his hands was killed in the strike. We have demonstrated tonight, he said, that there is a cost to the blood of our people and that our forces can reach any location in order to achieve this goal." Unquote. Hezbollah did not respond immediately. The organization has denied any role in the missile strike that murdered 12 young people in a football field in the Druze village of Majdal Shams on Saturday on the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. Shakur's death from wounds sustained in the strike was confirmed by a senior security source from a neighboring country. Shakur, according to Israel's military, was the main assistant to Hezbollah's Secretary General Hazan Nasrallah, who was also in charge of Saturday's strike and served as his consultant for combat operations. Three civilians, two of whom were children, were also killed in the Israeli strike on Beirut, southern suburb, according to the Lebanese Health Ministry, which was quoted by Lebanon's Al Namar TV. The attack surrounding Hezbollah's Shura Council, a decision making body in the Harit Rik neighborhood, resulted in 74 injuries and three fatalities. 
uh, the Hezbollah has denied any role in the Golan assault. It has acknowledged that it fired rockets against Golan Heights military objective. High-level Western diplomacy was sparked by the teens' death in an attempt to prevent a significant escalation that may inflame the Middle East as a whole. Israel and Hezbollah last engaged in a significant conflict in 2006. Since then, Hezbollah and Israel had been exchanging gunfire in the Gaza War, which started in October last year, when Hezbollah started shooting its Israeli targets in an apparent show of support for the Palestinian people. Even though the conflict has raised concerns about the possibility of a slide into regional war, hostilities had mainly remained within the frontier region, and both sides have previously stated they do not seek a larger confrontation. The situation complicated even more on the negotiations for a ceasefire and release of Israeli hostages when a top military and political officer of the Hamas leader, Ismail Haniyeh, was killed a few days later in a planted bomb explosion in Tehran, Iran. Calls from Hamas and Hezbollah for Iran to retaliate has been echoed from different places in the region. The U.S. is concerned and cautioned against further escalation of the violence in the region. Colombia demands that the international community audit the results of the election in Venezuela in a report from Reuters. Luis Murillo, Colombia's foreign minister, demanded Tuesday that Venezuela's administration make the election results public on Sunday so that the world community could audit them. In a video that was uploaded in Twitter, Murillo declared all the certificates of the final results and for them to be audited by the world are necessary for peace in Venezuela. President Nicolas Maduro was declared the winner of the election by the National Electoral Authority of Venezuela, which sparked accusations of fraud. Independent pollsters and opposition politicians criticized the announcement of the win as improbable. Al Jazeera indicated that Maduro won by 51% while opposition candidate Edmundo Gonzalez got 44% of the votes. The government accused the opposition of trying to rig the results and doing the very worst to suspend the elections. The election was met with both protests organized by opposition and counter-protests led by supporters of Maduro. Reports show the opposition-led protests instigated mass violence and riots in the streets of Caracas. Venezuela's capital, while counter-protesters vocally expressed support peacefully. While the elections have mixed reactions internationally, journalists and sources inside Venezuela say that the elections were fair and legit, while opposition led by Edmundo Gonzalez and Maria Corina Machado have called the election a fraud. However, activists and investigators alike said that both Machado and Gonzalez are not friendly to the interests of the Venezuelan people. One U.S.-based activist said, The U.S. has tried to destabilize and undermine the legitimacy of basically every Venezuelan election in recent memory. Ahead of the election, they always put out statements and media pieces declaring the election a fraud before it even happens. But what we have witnessed this week is tons of support for the Maduro government amongst the people here. Machado, a family of affluent and well-connected people in Caracas, loudly supports a mass privatization of different fields and has a long history with having ties to U.S. corporate interests, even meeting with then-President George W. Bush and has received money time to time from the U.S. government and has received an award from the National Endowment for Democracy, a front for the Central Intelligence Agency. She admitted years ago that Venezuela is not a dictatorship while calling for a U.S. military intervention throughout time, trying to overthrow the leftist government. 
In the Philippines, people continue to recover from the devastation of Super Typhoon Karina, internationally named Gaime. Smaller homes along the typhoon path were destroyed and massive flooding from torrential rains brought by the typhoon caused billions of pesos in damages to the private properties and public infrastructure and loss of income from agriculture and other livelihood. Our hearts and prayers goes to the families in the Philippines who are suffering. Locals in Metro Manila described the calamity as similar to Typhoon Undoy in 2009 when the winds exceeded 200 kilometers per hour and lots of rain to cause massive flooding. We are going to take a commercial break. When we come back, we will be joined here at the studio as our guest interviewee is State Senator Rochelle Wen, who is running for re-election in the Nevada State Senate. Please stay with us. Medical Equipment provides top-notch quality medical supply equipment. Whether to rent or buy, Pure Medical Equipment and Supplies has it all. Pure Medical Equipment is committed to serve and give back to Southern Nevada. We deliver medical supplies and rentals to your door. From the Telly Award winning creator of Love and Karma, Legacy and Ultra Feminist. Underneath the bright neon lights of Sin City, where fortunes are won and lost in an instant, and the truth can be a bit hazy. Join Elena, a hardworking single mother, her hot-headed son Miguel, and Gabriel, a Filipino pop star on the brink of international stardom, as they embark on a journey of self-discovery, love, and the courage to find one's voice and speak the truth. Made to Shine, coming soon. Presented by Philam TV Network. Written and directed by Giovanni Espiritu. To keep updated or for more information, visit philamtv.us slash made to shine or scan the QR code to be added to the email list for updates and upcoming opportunities to be part of the show. Executive produced by Sam Buban and Esmeralda Padilla Gould. Welcome back to The Pulse. With us now is State Senator Rochelle Nguyen of Nevada State Senate District 3. Rochelle, uh, thank you for joining us here at The Pulse. No, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to sp talk about what's happening in Nevada. It's our pleasure too. Before we go to the questions, please uh, tell our viewers a bit about yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Rochelle Wynn. I proudly represent Senate District 3, which is located in central Las Vegas. Um, I always talk about how I live in the central part of my district. My district actually extends all the way from where I live near Rancho and Charleston in the UMC area, but I extend all the way up the 95 to Ann Road. So I proudly represent 150,000 Nevadans that live within Senate District 3. Uh, Rochelle, you are the second incumbent uh, state senator uh, we had here at the polls. Uh, Pat Spearman was here last year. Um, how close is the state senate uh, from being a democratic uh, supermajority? Well, it's hard to follow in the footsteps of Senator Spearman, and so I'm really happy to be here. Um, she is, this is the end of her term. Um, yes. She is term limited out. So we will have to retain her seat, mm -hmm. um, which I am confident that Shelley Cruz Crawford will be able to take on that oh, like okay. role. Um, and try to start filling those shoes and building her own reputation. Um, but in order for the state Senate to obtain a supermajority, we need to pick up one, one seat. seat. But we also have to retain all of the seats that we currently have as yes, well. Yes, yes. 
So, uh, Senator Wen, does the state Senate have the power to override a veto from the governor? Not the Senate, but the entire legislature okay. has to. So we have to have a supermajority in each house in order to override any governor's veto. Uh, what committees are you a chair or co-chair uh, in the state Senate uh, in this you know, and what you hope to be in, in next year's session? Um, well, I previously came from the assembly where okay. I was the vice chair and the chair, uh, the vice chair of judiciary, mm -hmm. which handles everything from our laws to probate and family law um, and cannabis. So a vi wide range of things that are handled in the judiciary committee. I'm still on the judiciary committee in the Senate. Previously, I served as the chair of the health and human services committee in the assembly, and I currently serve as the vice chair. Probably my most significant role that I have to date is I chair the budget subcommittee for Senate Finance oh, for okay. Health and Human Services. So 61% of the state budget um, goes towards health care costs and that is the budget yes. that I'm responsible for. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Very Do you nice. foresee any increase of federal funding for the Medicaid program in Nevada next year? or will this be uh, dependent in the outcome of the November election for President and the U.S. Congress? What are your thoughts? I think protection of safety nets and things and programming that helps our most vulnerable always are on the chopping block when we're talking about okay. congressional races, mm -hmm. when we're talking about federal races. They control a vast majority of the money that comes and trickles down to states like us. It is uh, visible nationwide uh, that the Democratic Party is fired up now that VP uh, Kamala Harris is the presumptive nominee for president. So here's my two-part question. Uh, do you think we will continue uh, to have a Democratic president in the White House? And two, will the Dems uh, regain control of the House of Representatives? I think we're at an exciting point in history. Um, I'm so grateful, I should say, for all the work that President Biden has done mm -hmm, to course. help bring stability after the COVID pandemic and coming out of the COVID pandemic, yes. as well as coming out of four very anxiety-ridden years under the Trump administration, mm -hmm. you know, culminating with the January 6th insurrection. So um, I look forward to Vice President Harris becoming President Harris yes. for so many reasons. One, to have that representation. It's exciting and um, I know my daughter is excited. I know my son is excited. I know my family is excited for the idea that there will be our first female president. Yes. And the idea um, I know for my family that you know she represents people that have historically not been able to ascend to those levels of power is really exciting, mm -hmm. whether it's in the Asian community or in the black community. You know, I, I, I bump into a lot of uh, even even the guys like there's a. Well, this we're, this is exciting. We might uh, this country might finally have like a female uh, president, you know, and it's mm -hmm. uh, so it's like a it's going to be more hyped up than the previous elections. Yeah, it's like they, they said they've never seen this kind of excitement since uh, 2008 when Obama was running. <laughs> I I think you need sometimes that influx yeah. of energy and yes. um, empowerment, um, excitement. Um, she's fantastic. She's, she's, you know, a powerful yes. like woman yeah. who, you know, she's been a prosecutor. She has state attorney a general. state attorney general. Um, you know, she just has that breadth of experience that yes. I think will prove, will be great for our country. Yeah, and then uh, a lot of people that I talked of, uh, I talked with, I mean, said that they, they see the humanity in in uh, in Kamala than the other guy. That's <laughs> like you know. she's fun. Yeah. She can dance. She yeah. can. <laughs> 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 Who's running against you in the other side? Mm -hmm. I have two opponents. Oh, um, okay. I haven't heard much from them. I have a nonpartisan opponent and I have a Republican opponent. Mm -hmm. um, I just um, had a primary opponent that was pretty contentious okay. too. So, <laughs> um, you know, I 
have run in th this is my first Senate race. Okay. Um, but I have run multiple races as an Assemblywoman representing half of the district. I so see. when I was in Assembly District 10, so I'm confident that I will be able to expand that. I think coming out of this primary, um, you know, very victorious, like will give me some momentum going into I the general. Imagine. Last words from you, Senator, and talk to your voters. You know, um, when you look at me, I'm just a regular person. I didn't get into politics when I was like in infancy. In fact, I was in my 40s before I did it. Um, first and foremost, I'm a mom. I've got two kids that are in our public schools. One going into high school, which makes me as a mom very nervous. And I have another daughter who is in middle school. So I also have my husband who, um, you know, works a lot. I have my dad who is Vietnamese who also lives with us. So I see kind of multiple generations, you know, going through everything that affects us in our state. And so being able to be a part of solving problems that represent not only my family but uh -huh. everyone I think is what will make me the best candidate to retain my seat and come back into the state Senate and make sure that we are able to move forward as a state in Nevada and make it a better place for our families. Well uh, good luck on your race uh, uh, Rochelle. Candidate for a state Senate uh, District 3 Rochelle Wynn. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, we are out of time for this edition. Please join us again next time. I'm Sam Buban. Thank you for watching. And I'm Joe Buban. God bless your week.